Today, we're going to read The All-American Slurp by Lindsay Namioka. This is one of my favorites. The first time our family was invited out to dinner in America, we disgraced ourselves while eating celery. We had immigrated to this country from China, and during our early days here, we had a hard time with American table manners. In China, we never ate celery raw or any other kind of vegetable raw. We always had to disinfect the vegetables in boiling water first. When we were presented with our first relish tray, the raw celery caught us unprepared. We had been invited to dinner by our neighbors, the Gleasons. After arriving at the house, we shook hands with our hosts and packed ourselves into a sofa. As our family of four sat stiffly in a row, my younger brother and I stole glances at our parents for a clue as what to do next. Mrs. Gleason offered the relish tray to mother. The tray looked pretty with its tiny red radishes, curly sticks of carrots, and long slender stalks of pale green celery. Do try some of the celery, Mrs. Lynn, she said. It's from a local farmer and it's sweet. Mother picked up one of the green stalks and father followed suit. Then I picked up a stalk and my brother did too. So there we sat, each with a stalk of celery in our right hand. Mrs. Gleason kept smiling. Would you like to try some of the dip, Mrs. Lynn? It's my own recipe, sour cream and onion flakes with a dash of Tabasco sauce. Most Chinese don't care for dairy products, and in those days I wasn't even ready to drink fresh milk. Sour cream sounded perfectly revolting. Our family shook our heads in unison. Mrs. Gleason went off with the relish tray to the other guests, and we carefully watched to see what they did. Everyone seemed to eat the raw vegetables quite happily. Mother took a bite of her celery. Crunch. It's not bad she whispered. Father took a bite of his celery. Crunch. Yes, it is good, he said, looking surprised. I took a bite and then my brother. Crunch, crunch. It was more than good. It was delicious. Raw celery has a slight sparkle, a zangy taste that you don't get in cooked celery. When Mrs. Gleason came around with the relish tray, we each took another stalk of celery, except my brother. He took two. There was only one problem. Long strings ran through the length of the stock and they got caught in my teeth. When I help my mother in the kitchen, I always pull the strings out before slicing. I pulled the strings out of my stock. Zip, zip. My brother followed suit. Zip, zip. To my left, my parents were taking care of their own stocks. Zip, zip, zip. Suddenly I realized that there was dead silence except for our zipping. Looking up, I saw that the eyes of everyone in the room were on our family. Mr. and Mrs. Gleason, their daughter Meg, who was my friend, and their neighbors, the Bedells. They were all staring at us as we busily pulled the strings off of our celery. That wasn't the end of it. Mrs. Gleason announced that dinner was served and invited us to the dining table. It was lavishly covered with platters of food, but we couldn't see any chairs around the table, so we helpfully carried over some dining chairs and sat down. All the other guests just stood there. Mrs. Gleason bent down and whispered to us, This is a buffet dinner. You help yourselves to some food and eat it in the living room. Our family beat a retreat back to the sofa as if chased by the enemy soldiers. For the rest of the evening, too mortified to go back to the dining table, I nursed a bit of potato salad on my plate. Next day, Meg and I got on the school bus together. I wasn't sure how she would feel about me after the spectacle our family made at the party, but she was just the same as usual, and the only reference she made to the party was, Hope you and your folks got enough to eat last night. You certainly didn't take very much. Mom never tries to figure out how much food to prepare. She just puts everything on the table and hopes for the best. I began to relax. The Gleason's dinner party wasn't so different from a Chinese meal after all. 
My mother also puts everything on the table and hopes for the best. Meg was the first friend I had made after we came to America. I eventually got acquainted with a few other kids in school, but Meg was still the only real friend I had. My brother didn't have any problems making friends. He spent all his time with some boys who were teaching him baseball, and in no time he could speak English much faster than I could. Not better, but faster. I worried more about making mistakes, and I spoke carefully, making sure I could say everything right before opening my mouth. At least I had a better accent than my parents, who never really got rid of their Chinese accent, even years later. My parents had both studied English in school before coming to America, but what they had studied was mostly written English, not spoken English. Father's approach to English was a scientific one. Since Chinese verbs have no tense, he was fascinated by the way English verbs changed, changed form according to whether they were in the present, past, imperfect, perfect, pluperfect, future, or future perfect tense. He was always making diagrams of verbs and their inflections, and he looked for opportunities to show off his mastery of the pluperfect and future perfect tenses, his two favorites. I shall have finished my project by Monday, he would say smugly. My mother's approach was to memorize lists of polite phrases that would cover all possible social situations. She was constantly muttering things like, I'm fine, thank you, and you? Once she accidentally stepped on someone's foot and hurriedly blurted, oh, that's quite all right. Embarrassed by her slip, she resolved to do better next time. So when someone stepped on her foot, she cried, you're welcome. In her own different ways, we made progress in learning English, but I had another worry and that was my appearance. My brother didn't have to worry since mother bought him blue jeans for school and he dressed like all the other boys but she insisted that girls had to wear skirts. By the time she saw that Meg and the other girls were wearing jeans, it was too late. My, new out my school clothes were bought already and we didn't have any money left to buy new outfits for me. We had, we had too many other things to buy first, like furniture, pots, and pans. The first time I visited Meg's house, she took me upstairs to her room and I wound up trying on her clothes. We were pretty much the same size since Meg was shorter and thinner than average. Maybe that's how we became friends in the first place. Wearing Meg's jeans and t-shirt, I looked at myself in the mirror. I could almost pass for an American from the back. Anyway, at least the kids in school wouldn't stop and stare at me in the hallways, which was what they did when they saw me in my white blouse and navy blue skirt that went a couple of inches below the knees. When Meg, when Meg came to my house, I invited her to try on my Chinese dresses, the ones with a high collar and slits up the sides. Meg's eyes were bright as she looked at herself in the mirror. She struck several sultry poses and we nearly fell over laughing. The dinner party at the Gleason's didn't stop my growing friendship with Meg. Things were getting better for me in other ways too. Mother finally bought me some jeans at the end of the month. When father got his paycheck, she wasn't in any hurry about buying them at first until I worked on her. This is what I did. Since we didn't have a car in those days, I often ran down to the neighborhood store to pick up things for her. The groceries cost less at a big supermarket, but the closest one was many blocks away. One day when she ran out of flour, I offered to borrow a bike from our neighbor's son and buy a 10 pound bag of flour at the big supermarket. I mounted the boy's bike and waved to my mother. I'll be back in five minutes. Before I started pedaling, I heard her voice behind me. You can't go out in public like that. People can see all the way up your thighs. I'm sorry, I said innocently. I thought you were in a hurry to get the flour. For dinner, we were going to have pot stickers, fried Chinese dumplings, and we need a lot of flour. Couldn't you borrow a girl's bicycle? Complained mother. That way your skirt won't be pushed up. There aren't too many of those around, I said. Almost all the girls wear jeans while riding a bike, so they don't see any point in buying a girl's bike. We didn't eat pot stickers that evening, and mother was thoughtful. Next day, we took the bus downtown, and she bought me a pair of jeans. In the same week, my brother made the baseball team of his junior high school, Father started taking driving lessons, and mother discovered rummage sales. 
We soon got all the furniture we needed, plus a dartboard and a 1,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. 14 hours later, we discovered that it was a 999-piece jigsaw puzzle. There was hope that the Lynns might become a normal American family after all. <laughs>